You are now listening to the fastest show on IE Sports Radio. My name is Daryl Kinsey Jr. Welcoming you to another lap of the extra mile for today, May 18th, 2023. And ladies and gentlemen, the month of May is here in Indianapolis. Practice has been going all week long. Got a chance to watch some of that yesterday. Been busy at work today, but always fun to see Indy cars zipping around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We've got North Wilkesboro returning to the schedule and a lot more we got to talk about. And to join me tonight is my co-host, Michael Ward. Michael? Hello, everybody. How are you today? Well, if you are listening, make sure you get your comments in. We will read them out during the show. I'm doing great, by the way. Thank you so much for asking. We're getting into the racing weekend, which is always the best time for me. But before we go forward and we get into some of the more exciting things that happened over the week that was and the week that will be in motorsports, we unfortunately have to talk about some not-so-great news out of Italy. As this year's... Hold on, let's go ahead and do the annual How Long Is This Name Challenge for what was... This week's race. <clears throat> the Formula One Qatar Air- Airways Grand Primero del Mid in Italia El D'Emilia Romagna 2023, that is its entire name, has been canceled for 2023 due to torrential rain in Italy this week that has flooded. Most of the Emilia Romagna area and the racetrack. Uh, Chris, who is not here with us, he's actually out in the farm, pro- out on the farm, probably listening to us right now, as always. Sent us a photo, and I also saw that photo on Twitter of what was the TV compound, and it was a moat. And that is to say it uh, brief, or that's to say it mildly. Unfortunately, eight lives were lost in the flooding. Thousands others displaced from their home and Michael it it was really the people will say it's a good call but let's be honest it was the only call to make it was yeah it was the only call to make uh these cars are not able to drive in torrential floods so uh, honestly this was the only thing you can do a lot of us knew this race was going to get canceled Mm -hmm. so yeah it's unfortunate but then again you know there are other racing events that are happening this weekend and uh, you know, it's better to watch those than to watch Red Bull win by 15 seconds again. If you're <laughs> not a Red Bull fan. Yeah, I understand. But it's, uh, on a serious note, man, the, the weather situation yeah, the out weather there was just been crazy. Yeah. And it just wouldn't be feasible to do any sort of racing during the weekend, and it just wouldn't be fair, you know, to mo- bring all those emergency assets that are needed, let's be real, for much more important tasks right now than a motor race being sit sat over there at the racetrack. And that's even if the TV compound or relevant areas weren't flooded because the F2 compound was also Flooding. drenched in water. And the other and- situation, go ahead. And then, and then the thing about it, if this race would have been able to continue, like it, like it, it would have also been canceled because the rain would have been too bad, mm-hmm. and we don't want to use wet tires, so the rain race would have been canceled anyway. Well, the, and the much bigger issue there's a there's a river that runs behind the racetrack. It was it was a couple of feet over the retention uh, under the retention fence from spilling over onto the racetrack. So this was a uh, no-go situation and it br- situation. Yeah, and it brings me to a topic we got to talk racing fans uh, about some things. There are just some times where the weather is out of our control because on Twitter so many people saying, "Oh, Formula 1's gone soft. They could have ran the race today. They could have ran the race this weekend." da 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 da. da. Well, what? Boats? You would have needed H1 Unlimited to bring their boats over to get this race done. You were not running cars around that track. And the other thing, 
How are you going to get to the racetrack? All the roads are flooded out. Yeah, I don't... Yeah, I don't see how this race could have happened. Yeah. So, they will not race this week. Uh, The race will not be made up, so there will not be a... Formula One Qatar Airways Grand Primero del Made in in Italia... uh, E del Emilia Romagna Grand Prix in 2023. I'm not doing that again. So <laughs> that means our next race, if you want to call it that, will be in two weeks for the Monaco Grand Prix, which is more of the Monaco qualifying and then the parade on Sunday. And there was. At the beginning of the year, or at the beginning of the, uh, not really the beginning of this month, but end of last month, there were concerns about whether or not this race will go ahead because there is a threat that unions currently protesting some changes to the retirement system in France, threatening to shut the power off to Monte Carlo during the race weekend. So we could get to a cha- to a situation, Michael, where we might not have a race. Can you imagine Formula One going two weeks in a row? Not two race weekends in a row where we have to cancel the race? This will be a crazy year. It'll be absolutely unprecedented. And it would just show that this is this season and trying to get over this twenty three race plateau has just been cursed. Uh we've had China get canceled yet again due to COVID restrictions. Those finally went away, but God only knows we'll be going back there. Uh, We've seen the situation in Imola. Monaco might get canceled due to protest. It it just seems like there's a glass ceiling of races that we're not supposed to cross. Yeah, I mean, um, honestly, I like Imola, but honestly, do we need a second Italian Grand Prix? That is a great question. Uh, the contract Do we need does three U.S. Grand Prix. No, absolutely not. Especially not the prices they're uh, selling them at. So it's just like I felt like we breached the glass ceiling, and I just feel like a lot of these races don't actually need to happen. Monaco, I'll throw a bone to because Monaco is the crown jewel of Formula One, supposedly. But you know, mm-hmm. that's the only that's the only exception on it. Is it though? It's but, the crown jewel. It's let's be real. It's the crown it's jewel because of the party. The racing has not been good in our lifetime at this racetrack. If you want to call it that. Banger. I don't even remember what happened in the 2008 race, to it be honest. It rained. That's all you need to know. Okay, so we need a weather system to make you the race exciting. We need, to do? we need to put sprinklers on the track. No, Bernie. All right, dude, I don't know how, how to make this race interesting. Yeah. I know how. I mean, Take it off the schedule. <laughs> I don't care if it's a party... The history is great, kinda, but it's not exciting at all. All I can think of is just making a night race. <laughs> okay, so it's at night and still sucks. But it's at night. Okay, and the Vegas Grand Prix is going to be at night. They want to move Miami to night race. It's not going to be fun. But it's going to be at night. Being at night does not stop it from being terrible. But it'll look cooler. Uh huh. I'm trying. I know you are. Trying. You're failing, but I, I I'm appreciate failing you for trying. Badly, but I'm failing. I mean, and I've said it on this show, Michael, you've heard it every year since you've been on here. It's probably the worst of the Memorial Day trifecta. Yeah, it's, it's the worst. Also, what is F1's fascination with street circuits all of a sudden? 
That is a Liberty Media thing, and I wish it would stop. Street races are great for the glitz and glam, but the actual racing product, you know, the, the reason we're here, rarely is it good. And I am yes, not d- down with taking away permanent circuits for more of these awful street course races. Yeah, because uh, I think the president of Spain said he wants the F1 race to be moved from Barcelona to a street race in Madrid. And I was just like, why? There's cultural beef going on there, I think. Spain has... Okay, but- its issues. I, I'm not even going to begin to dig into it. Okay, but no. Yeah. Can we? Can we not? I mean, it's already bad enough that we're at Barcelona, where there's very little passing. Do we want to take it to a street course where there's going to be no passing? I and I just, I and, just and saw. To be what... honest with you, I don't think that little change they made to basically make the circuit the old circuit. Uh, I don't really think that's going to help with these cars. Larry says a night Monaco race is the Raiders leaving Oakland to go to Vegas. It's a cooler stadium, but the team still sucks. Basically. Speaking of which, not to switch from racing, but I don't know if you've seen the situation going on in Arizona and Larry probably has. Um, Phoenix Coyotes, uh, the Tempe stadium plan, not going to work out. So, I have no idea where that team's going to go. And that just reminded me because of the uh, Oakland situation with the Raiders. Uh, although the difference is, it's the town telling the team, we don't, wanna, we don't want you here. Uh, kind of like how race fans are telling most of the F1 schedule, we don't want you here. Mm. So Yeah, we, we got to make some big changes to these to these uh, locations because everything being a street circuit is it's it's not the move Yeah, one more thing before we head to the next topic uh, we're hearing and Christian Horner is saying this so take it with a grain of salt six teams broke the cost cap last year who the hell cares <laughs> what is the point of the cost cap if they're not going to use it, what is if the they're not the going to stay under it. What is the point of the cost cap is the team that breached the cost cap is not 15 seconds ahead of the rest of the field. And Chris is not here to defend his team. And I, and I don't want to jump on them that much, that much, but the, the I mean, unfortunate I said it in a group chat. So the, the unfortunate <laughs> part is this, when they did not, bring down the hammer on Red Bull for their breach that opened the floodgates because they basically said we're not actually going to do they're not actually going to do anything to us if we go over it a little so everybody's going over the cost cap because they already know you're not going to do anything who cares about the wind tunnel time if you found 15 seconds over the rest of the field Exactly. Okay, take that and wind know, tunnel time. We're winning by thirty seconds. Say, and I know people are gonna say, "Oh, that's that's wind tunnel time during development over the season." And I'm like, "My my G, you're already fifteen seconds ahead of the field." Yeah. These upgrades, these teams are gonna find is gonna be a tenth, tenth and a half. Yeah. Okay. It's cost cap. You might as well release. You might as well remove the goddamn cost cap. Yes, because obviously what you tried to do didn't work. Team breached the cost cap, and now they're 15 seconds ahead of the rest of the field, making this season boring. So, GGF one. Yeah. So if you can't tell I'm salty. I'm very salty. You're not the only one salty. So. It's absolutely ridiculous, but this is the bed that we have been laid by Formula One, and now the rest of us have to have to sleep in it. 
So we'll see how this continues next time out in Monaco. But we got to get to Darlington. Ross. Hold on. Nope. We're doing government names. Oh, man. Back to government names. Ross Lee Chastain. If you don't stop running into people. I'm over it. Half the grid is over it. Chris is over it. (laughs) I'm over it. Rick Hendrick is over it. It has been a year and a half with this man. I'm done. Something real quick. Go ahead. You know a man has absolutely screwed up in NASCAR if Rick freaking Hendrick has to come up on Mike and says he had had enough. Well, Rick Hendrick has had his cars destroyed. Four of them. <laughs> or no, three yeah, of them. All, all, yeah, all four. <laughs> because, and it's been the five, three times. And I'm going to read, this is from NBCSports.com. You can find these comments pretty much anywhere at this point. But our bestest best buddy, Rick Hendrick, not happy. Um, this is what he had to say. I don't care if he's driving. Well, first, let me get into what Ross Chastain did, which was six laps to go. He tried to move Kyle Larson up the racetrack. And instead of moving him up the racetrack, he ended up putting Larson and himself in the wall. Now, Larson showed his frustration by keeping his foot in the gas and basically pushing Chastain all the way down the back stretch. Uh, his car was destroyed. the same thing. Chastain finished 29th. Larson finished 20th. Guess who picked Larson for nearest the win this week? It was me. Guess who was going to win if Chastain didn't do what he did this week? You. Yeah. Not a happy camper. This is what Rick Hendrick had to say to the media. I don't care if he's driving a Chevrolet. If he wrecks our cars, I don't care. I've told Chevrolet that if you wreck us, you're going to get it back. If you don't do it, they'll run all over you. So Rick Hendrick pretty much said, we're going to get it back in blood. Um, I am loyal to Chevrolet, but when somebody runs over us, then I expect my guys to hold their ground. I'm not going to ask them to yield just because of Chevrolet. He continues. He doesn't have to be that aggressive. Hendrick is talking about Chastain at this point. I guess at this point in the race, maybe you're super aggressive, but you just don't run people up in the fence. He's going to make a lot of enemies. It's hard to win a championship when you've got a lot of paybacks out there. Woo! Rick is hot. Uh, Michael, your reaction to those comments, and then I'll give my reaction. Like I said, you know you're going goof if Rick Hendrick is on you. That's that is, that's the most fired up I've ever heard Rick Hendrick say. And here's the thing. Um, Trackhouse Racing might be a team for Hendrick or for Chevrolet. Rick Hendrick is Chevrolet in NASCAR. They're the winningest team for the mark. Over 200 wins. So many goats came out of that stable between Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson. We got Kyle Larson over there now after he came from ECR, who has won a championship. Rick, I mean, um, Chase Elliott won a championship. We don't even have to talk about the Jimmy Johnson domination. Those cars are always in the playoffs, always a threat to go deep in the playoffs. When Rick Hendrick speaks, people tend to listen. And when your flagship Chevy team is saying, I'm getting tired of this guy, and I don't care if he's got a bow tie on the front of his car like mine, they tend to listen. And if you saw Chastain's comments this week where he said, I have to stop hitting stuff, kind of tells me somebody from Chevrolet gave Justin Marks a call. 
And Justin Marks gave a call to Chastain to cut it out. Which also oh brings up, yeah, which also brings up another topic that we got to get to. I don't like blaming the media st- for stuff, but the media has to take some of the blame of this. I am sick and gosh darn tired of every time there is somebody that runs out of talent and runs into somebody, they throw up the, well, you want to like Dale Sr. Well, Dale Sr. did this. Dale Sr. did that. Dale Sr. is dead. We all watched Dale Earnhardt Sr. die. In February 2001. He ain't here no more. I don't want to hear about what Dale Earnhardt Sr. would have did. Also, there's only one person that was the heir to the Dale Earnhardt Sr. throne. It was his son. He didn't want it. So I don't want to hear about the next Dale Earnhardt Sr. Because there ain't one. Ross Chastain is not Dale Earnhardt Sr. For all the wrecks... Chastain has had this year. He ain't won, has he? Big goose egg in that win title, win column this year. And even though he's winning the participation trophy points right now, or he was, it's not going to mean anything in the playoffs when half the field wants to take his head off. Joey Logano tried this in 2015. You know what happened to Joey Logano? Ended up beefed in the wall at Martinsville by Matt Kenseth. It was awesome. <laughs> that is Ross Chastain if he doesn't cool it. And I was a fan of the guy, but his antics are making me less a fan of him. Because he's not being aggressive, he's just being careless. And he's leading the championship by 27 in the regular season standings. That's great. But he's though that DNF total currently is sitting at one. That's gonna start stacking if he keeps pissing people off. I think that's my view on it. Uh Michael, what do you think? Uh you pretty well said everything I couldn't I could think of. Uh the man needs to race clean and bring it on home and that's how you win championships. You don't win championships by making enemies. And so far, I have to feel it doesn't like you, so. Yep. He's just got to stop hitting people and uh, bring home the uh, results. Yep. And before that, those two got into it. Uh, Chastain and Larson kind of checked up the field, which caused a wreck that stacked up about four or five cars and changed the complexity of that race. But NASCAR and getting the scoring right was a struggle on Sunday um drivers that were in the wreck included um in the wreck that took out Martin Truex Jr. included Kevin Harvick Ryan Blaney and Chase Elliott all three of whom had serious damage to their cars but were able to get back in front of Bubba Wallace who had his best weekend of the season in my opinion finishing in the top five after qualifying second had a Pretty good race, had to fight back from some adversity, but they were able to get back into it. Um, They ended up scoring several cars back in front of the 23 because they, quote, kept reasonable pace car speed. But the rule is, if you're in the wreck, you go to the back. And those cars on the TV cameras were clearly in the wreck. So, Michael, I'm trying to understand how cars that were absolutely destroyed, including Kevin Harvick, who ended up finished second, got in front of cars that were not damaged in the wreck. Um, yeah, that definitely sounds... Yeah, that's, that sounds like a problem, actually. Yeah. And it, it came with other issues on Sunday where they lost... Ra- they. The um, caution lot lights were inoperable at one point. They had issues with radio communications. Um, somebody was on the channel that wasn't supposed to be. It was a rough day at the office for NASCAR officiating. The one thing we got to get to, it has not been good this year, the officiating. 
The cautions are taking way too long because they can't get the cars in order. We, we have lost how to get cars back in line. Um, some of the rulings that they've made have not been that great. And we're really missing Hoots, uh, the previous race director, David Hoots, from the uh, from the tower. And I know we've got a new team and they've got to get better, but it's been a couple of years now. This is absolutely unacceptable. Yeah, I would agree with you, you there, Daryl. It's unacceptable and uh, something needs to be changed or something needs to be improved in order to get the officiating better because there's just been that much of a struggle this year. Mm-hmm. So, well, hopefully things will get better, although, sadly, I doubt it. But we did have the throwback weekend this week. Uh, Michael, did you see any of the uh, throwback schemes? Oh, yeah. I love them. What was uh, your I favorite love... scheme? Um, my piss you off. But uh, ironically, Ross Chastain. <laughs> that uh, was I, a good... I was a fan of... I, w- I was a fan of the UPS paint scheme back, back in the day. That was a good-looking car. Yeah. And I want to say, I want to pick that one, but man, Ross, um, the number six, the classic Castro GTX scheme, throwing it back to Gran Turismo and John Force back in the day. That one also has to be on the list. That was a great looking scheme. I thought the Menard scheme throwing back to Ryan Blaney's dad, Dave Blaney was also pretty cool. And speaking of dad schemes, did you see Harrison Burton with the Jeff Burton throwback? Yes, I saw that. The Exide Batteries car throwing back those. He swept Darlington in that scheme, including the rain delayed race. He was doing the rain dance, which was hilarious. Yeah. The Mark Donahue. Go ahead. I know you just mentioned uh, Chase Elliott in the number nine. I missed that paint scheme, by the way. I'm sorry. I had somebody like in my ear, but um, I miss that paint scheme, and that's actually like one of my favorite paint schemes because that just reminded me of the days Chase Elliott's paint scheme. Mm-hmm. It just reminded me of the days Dodge was there. Dodge was lit when they first started. I'm, I'm sad that, that they uh disappeared. That brought back so many memories of just when Dodge was there and they were competitive. I want them back. I wish they were, I want them back so bad. <laughs> and they're never coming back. Sadly. So, the Mark Donahue scheme, I think, has to be best in show, though. The blue, white, oh. and red. Oh, um, Penske. That car looks so good. I want that as a die cast. I really want that. I don't want to blow all my money on die cast, but there's so many good throwbacks. I, I wish we had done a throwback for uh, Bubba Wallace, but he did not do one. Uh, the classic uh, Jeff Gordon chromed out scheme. I didn't like that scheme as a kid. You know, really? it, it looked it looked good as a throwback, but it just looks boring to me. I had um, a. Dale Earnhardt, uh, you know when they were doing the uh, champions paint schemes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had that one in Chrome. I had Tony Stewart's in Chrome, and who else did I have in Chrome? I think that was it. Yeah. yeah. And wrapping up a little bit of off track, Tyler Reddick lost his crew chief due to a pre race tech penalty. Looks like they had some weight or some of the ballast not. Um, set in the right place so 10 point deduction for that team lost his crew chief during the race that is unfortunate but 10 points doesn't hurt you that much he's already in the playoffs so not that big of or 
obviously not that big of a deal, but uh, didn't end up hurting Reddick that badly. What did end up hurting Reddick, however, getting caught up in the late race crash, he ended up well down the order. But on the other hand, Bubba Wallace, we talk about him a lot on this show for obvious reasons. Huge Bubba Wallace fan. Um, he is. He ended up finishing fifth after qualifying second. On Sunday, two straight top five finishes. This team is on to something, and they're finally getting back rolling where they're supposed to be. And yeah. with that, with the two top fives, the most important part, now in the playoffs, in the 15th spot, Bubba Wallace. Last summer, that team got on a huge run They fell just short of the playoffs. They get on this run now of good finishes where they're supposed to be, especially on the mile and a half, where there is a lot of them during the summertime. He's going to be a threat to win in a lot of races. And Bubba Wallace, I really think if he gets in those playoffs, Michael, I think he's going to get to the round of eight. Just judging by what they did last year, that team down the stretch, absolutely on fire. If they can pull that off again, they're going to be a threat and they're going to knock some championship contenders out. Yeah, I think if they just stay consistent and uh, you know, try to maybe try to fight for wins, but if they can't win, definitely try to get the high points finish. If they can do all of that, then I think they'll have a really good chance at uh, getting to the round of eight. It's just a matter of staying consistent, which I believe they can do. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. I I really hope they do, Daryl. I really hope they do. This would be really great to see. Yeah, and coming up is going to be the all-star race at North Wilkesboro. So no points races this weekend. So nearest the wind will be off this weekend. But this is going to be the crowning achievement of North Wilkesboro. That track has been in a state of disuse for 30 years. And, Michael, it's finally back from the dead um, how do you think the racing will be, though, on Sunday? Because we know how the short track package is with this car. But on the other hand, this is a well-worn-out uh, surface they're going to be on. I don't know, honestly. Um, there could be a lot of bumping. Mm-hmm. Bumping runs, maybe even some dunks. Well, actually, you can't dump cars anymore. But, yeah, um... It, it might be good. It might not be good. We'll have to see, honestly. Like, I, I can't really say. But um, I think it's going to be a fun race. Mm-hmm. It will be fun. It'll be 8 o'clock tomorrow night. I'll actually be out. I'll be just getting home from HRL in Cambridge as they're going to start their season here in Maryland. So I'll be at that race on Sunday. Come home and watch some... Uh, NASCAR to fall asleep. Going to be fun. So, going forward, coming up in a couple of weeks, Indy 500, can't wait. Started with practice this weekend. Qualifying is going to be on Saturday and Sunday, but before then, we get to the GMR Grand Prix, and this was really a battle at the end between Christian Lundgaard for Ray Hall Edmund Racing and Alex Pillow. Uh, for Oh, by the way, in the NASCAR race, it was won by William Byron, who ended up pulling up off the win, being the beneficiary of the Chastain versus Larson Chaos to take the win and lock himself into the playoffs. But in IndyCar, the battle at the end was between Christian Lungard and Alex Pillow. And unfortunately, tire strategy was not on Lungard's side. They kept him out long in the late late race going, pitted on lap 59 for prime tires. Pillow pits on lap 60 for scuffed red tires, the alternates. But they were fast enough to get him out front. And it's going to be Pato O'Ward that finally, I'm sorry, Alex Pillow, sorry, that picks up the win with Pato Award and Alexander Rossi, the Arrow McLaren duo, finishing second and third. 
this was an entertaining GMR Grand Prix. Uh, Mike, we had teammates, uh, Malukas and Rob get together, Stingray Rob get together on lap two. That was unfortunate. But uh, those two teammates have not had the best season at all. And the last thing you want to do is take yourself and your teammate out on the second lap of the race. Yeah, that's not ideal. It's it's kind of the number one rule in racing is don't wreck your teammate and you wreck yourself and your teammate. So that's definitely not a good good uh, good deal. Yeah. So we go from the GMR race to the Indy 500. They're on the oval. They've been there all this week. And we're getting ready for qualifying. Four laps. Average speed will determine your spot. The thing I always look at is how much does winning at that track, the um, road course, how much momentum does that really give you going to an oval? Because, or going into the Indy 500, because to be honest, yeah, you got to win at Indy, it puts a spring in your step, but what you just did on Saturday has nothing to do with what you're going to be doing the next couple of weeks. Yeah, you got a point there, and uh, I don't know. I just feel like it's just one of those races where it's just like, like you said, it puts a spring in your step. It's not really needed, and I feel like it's just kind of one of those races that are just here just for the spectacle, mm-hmm. just for you, you know. We got this one race here, and then in a couple of weeks, we got the Indy 500, you know, just, you know, stop the fill hotels. You know, fill workplace, fill staff, fill the grandstands. You know, it's just, I feel like it's just stuff like that. Just kind of a cash, cash grab, if you ask me. Well, it's fun. We'll see how it goes. As we are now getting ready to go into the next, see, or going into this weekend. Big question. Are we going to see a new poll record at the Indy 500. Last year, Scott Dixon, that blazing four lap average, 234.046, set the new pole record, was the second fastest four lap average of all time. Just an incredible run. Tony Stewart ended up setting a track record in 1996. Although this that tr- the track was resurfaced earlier before that race, so it's going to be a lot of fun to see how that runs. I want to see how fast if anybody can top that Scott Dixon lap because that lap was absolutely incredible. Yeah, it was absolutely incredible. And it will definitely shows you how fast these cars can go. Um, I don't know if anybody's going to top that, but if they get close, hats off to you. Yeah. So we got 34 cars going for 33 spots. One car will go home. That is unfortunate, but it is the drama of Indy 500 qualifying. And on Saturday, all day, they will be making laps. They will be taking time to see who will get into the Fast 9 shootout, and the last row shootout to see who will be in the fastest 33 for the greatest spectacle on earth, trademarked. (laughs) That was from a conversation we were having earlier on in the, actually before we came on, uh, Formula 1 got real close to impeding on the trademark of IndyCar with the Indy 500 was the greatest spectacle on earth. And uh, that was during the Miami Grand Prix that they almost did that Formula One. IndyCar was not pleased at all. And they made their uh, issues heard on that. So, Man, they really think <laughs> Miami was better than the Indy. Indy. Oh, that's funny. So we move on to this weekend. Again, not a lot of uh, points racing, unfortunately. Thank you, Mother Nature. But 
we go into the all-star race. We also got the Nürburgring 24 coming up. And Michael, that race is always hilarious because you have everything from modern GT3 to 90s era touring cars out on that track for this 24-hour race on one of the scariest racetracks in the world. I have no idea how they keep things straight on this race. I will say it's compelling television. I I really can't wait to see how it runs, and it'll be on YouTube all weekend. Uh, What's your excitement level for it? Uh, That's pretty high. I love this track. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite tracks of all time. Um, There are companies that make these little uh, plaques that you can put on your wall. And uh, the Nürburgring is one of them. The Ma is one of them. Uh, what what else? Uh, Panorama, Mount Panorama is definitely one of them. And uh, I can't think of a Formula One track to put on there. But yeah, that though uh, Nürburgring is definitely. I'm sorry, not Nürburgring. Nordschleife is one of the greatest tracks of all time it is truly hell on earth to drive and to see these guys tackle it for not one lap not two lap but a whole 24 hours of multi-class racing it's gonna be a spectacle i i'm i can't wait for it i'm actually gonna attempt to sit down and watch this race because last year i i wasn't able to uh, this mm-hmm. year, I think I'm going to be able to. So I'm definitely going to watch this race. And um, I, I just love endurance racing. It's just it's just fun. It's just fun to see. Endurance racing is just so, so fun. And it will be a lot of fun to see that race. And I'll be flipping between that and Peacock for Indy 500 qualifying. Cannot wait. Give me a fun weekend. And we do have the all-star race coming up this weekend. So get your starters in that in just a moment. Just give me one moment. So we will not be picking this race for nearest the win, obviously, as there aren't our actual points being put out for that race. So, in the all-star race, we will have 37 cars there that weekend. They will be split between the NASCAR Open and the actual all-star race. And it'll be 21 in that race. One car, or two cars, or the 21 already in. And then we will put one from each stage of the All-Star Open plus fan vote that will give us our entire field. So Chastain, Sindrick, Dillon, Harvick, Larson, Keselowski, Bush, Elliott, Hamlin, Blaney, Briscoe, Chase Bush, sorry, Chris Busher, not Chase, Martin Truex Jr., Chris Bell, Joey Logano, Bubba Wallace, Byron, Jones, Reddick, Stenhouse, and Suarez will be in the All-Star race proper. Bowman Alex Bowman was eligible to compete, but he fractured a vertebrae in a sprint car race. Josh Berry will have to qualify through the All-Star Open. The Open will have Corey LaJoy, Eric Amarola, Chandler Smith, J.J. Yaley, A.J. Allmendinger, Harrison Burton, Justin Haley, Michael McDowell, Todd Gillen, Ryan Priest, Noah Gregson, Joey, Josh Berry, sorry, Ryan Newman, Ty Gibbs, Ty Dillon, and Josh Balicki. And on Friday night, guess what's back, Michael? Guess what's no, back? Darryl, back? You tell me. Back again. The All-Star Pit Crew Challenge. Challenge. It'll be a part of qualifying, and each team will actually get their qualifying in the All-Star race <laughs> determined by how long it takes their crews to complete a four-tower race. Four tires stop, sorry. And the timing lines will be one box behind and one box ahead of the designated pit box. That's going to be incredible to watch, really giving these crews 
something to work for. We all want the classic pit crew challenge back from the old days, but this will suffice, I think. Yeah, I think it will suffice. So that said, we're going to go ahead and get ready to get on out of here for this evening, this weekend. Watch our Twitter as I will be out in Cambridge for the Hydroplane Racing League. We'll have some videos of the boats going around the water as they start their first runs of the season. And if you're going to any tracks this weekend, you have fun as well. Uh, Michael can be found at Michael underscore Ward 25. I can be found at DK Junior 12. Make sure to keep it locked to our Facebook, Instagram, or to our social media pages on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And on TikTok as well. Also, make sure to keep it locked to iSportsRadio.com and get in on the Patreon to get free uh, iSports Radio merchandise, a shout out on the show, and access to our podcast, Academy, and more. So that will do. Oh, and also, if you haven't heard or if you missed any episode of any iSports Radio show, check out the YouTube repository and anywhere you can hear your podcast to get caught up on every show on iSports Radio. So, that'll wrap it up for this week. My name is Daryl for Michael and myself. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you at the next Green Flag. Good night, everybody.